This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by Brilliant, a problem-solving website that teaches you to think like an engineer. When Hurricane Sandy struck New York on October 29, 2012, it pushed a deluge of water through the city, breaking the city's coastal defences with ease, flooding homes, subways and businesses alike. It inundated electric facilities, causing power outages across the city. All told, the storm and flooding is estimated to have caused $19 billion of damage and tragically claimed the lives of 43 people. How cities react to adversity like this tells you a great deal about their character, and New York responded swiftly. The flooding that Hurricane Sandy caused was an unfortunate combination of factors. As the hurricane traced its path along the eastern coast of the United States, it looked set to curve out into the Atlantic, a glancing blow for New York. But its march was halted when a high-pressure zone from the north blocked its progress, causing the counterclockwise spiralling storm to whip its winds into New York. The storm pushed a wall of water across the Atlantic, arriving at its peak at 9.24pm, just a half hour after a full moon high tide. It's impossible to predict when the next storm like this will hit New York, but we do know the likelihood of flooding is rising. Looking at high water events in Lower Manhattan over the past 70 years, we can parse some data. Besides the clear increase in frequency of extreme high water events in the past decade thanks to increases in frequencies in hurricanes, these data points don't show any real trend. Hurricane Sandy broke records, but singular data points like this aren't particularly useful. Let's attribute each individual foot of sea level height to the three primary factors that drive it. Tide level, storm surge and sea level rise as a result of climate change since the start of the 18th century. Now, let's set a bar we absolutely do not want to cross. At 10.5 feet of high water, the New York City subway system floods. In September 1960, the subway came within just a half foot of flooding. If we adjust the sea level rise attributed to climate change to the present day, September 1960, two would have passed this critical level. This is not a prediction. This is a measurable sea level rise. Humans have been measuring sea levels for a long time. It's a simple task of placing a ruler by the water. Sea level rise is going to continue. This is an irrefutable fact. The ocean is warming. Water expands when it heats. The estimated thermal expansion of the upper 700 meters of the sea between 1971 and 2010 as a result of a warming rate of 0.015 degrees Celsius per decade will result in sea level rises between 0.4 and 0.8 millimeters per year. You can dismiss this data. You can argue against it. You can ignore simple scientific principles. You are free to buy a home in a projected flood zone. The world will go on. However, the rest of us will continue the logical steps of preparation. Hurricane Sandy caused $19 billion of damage. If that $19 billion of wealth had instead been used to prepare New York's coastline, what could it have achieved? We know storm surge barriers work. The Netherlands has proven that these systems work. They have built an entire network of storm surge barriers that not only protect their existing cities, but help reclaimed once unusable land from the sea. We have covered their use of storm surge barriers in the past, so we won't go into the engineering detail, but a link for that video will be attached in the end card of this video for you to watch after this one. Potential storm surge barrier locations have been planned for New York with two primary options. Three smaller storm surge barriers could be placed, one in the Narrows, one at Arthur Kill and another on the East River. Alternatively, a large storm surge barrier could connect New Jersey to the Rockaway Peninsula with another barrier in the East River once again. These would, without a doubt, provide immense protection for New York. But for now, the plans were rejected for a number of reasons. One, the costs were too high, potentially costing up to $25 billion. Two, the design, approval and construction process could take up to three decades to complete. Three, massive levees would have to be constructed along the nearby coastline, such as the Rockaway Peninsula, 
to ensure a storm surge couldn't simply go around the barriers. This would significantly alter the terrain of these highly populated areas, which likely wouldn't go down well with the residents. Four, the barriers could cause more severe flooding for areas not protected by them, like Long Island and those to the northeast of the East River Barrier. And finally, the barriers would have a significant environmental impact on the ecology of the bay. I cannot imagine that New York, a city with a GDP over $1.5 trillion, would continue shunning the idea of a storm surge barrier if the risks continue to rise. However, for now, they have gone for a more community-driven approach, and this is what they came up with. This is the map of the plan proposed in 2013, just a year after the devastation of Hurricane Sandy. It's a drastic overhaul of its coastal defenses, priced at a cost of 20 billion. Just over, if you count 1 billion as just over, the estimated cost of damage from Hurricane Sandy. It's a complex variety of localized multi-purpose protections. This was the general path the storm surge took through New York City when Hurricane Sandy struck. The first part of this plan is to create barriers in the water to remove some of the kinetic energy and reduce the height and power in the waves. The first line of defenses here will be offshore breakwaters located in these locations. A living breakwater project due for construction this year off the south shore of Staten Island will consist of a rock mound covered with a bedding stone layer. These rocks will be chosen and textured to encourage a revival in local ecologies like oyster reefs. Other on-land projects will also aim to reduce wave power and provide protection, like living shorelines and wetland areas, highlighted in these regions on the map. Brooklyn Bridge Park is a living shoreline that was built before Hurricane Sandy struck and it held up incredibly well and fulfilled its purpose of protecting the residents of Brooklyn. Flooding, but keeping the water out of the Brooklyn streets. The plants here, like the pitch pines along the stabilized shoreline, are salt resistant. The soil of the park has a high sand content to help salt water drain away quickly, and if needed, the irrigation system of the park has been designed to flush salt water out of the soil. There are many more projects like this planned for around New York, and they differ depending on the terrain and space available. Soon after Hurricane Sandy, New York City began constructing 7.2 kilometers of 4 meter high sand dunes here on the Rockaway Peninsula, built simply with sandbags covered with sand and stabilized with grasses and fencing, a cheap solution that fits the natural environment and will help prevent the damaging flooding that occurred here in 2012. And this approach of beach reinforcement and beach nourishment will be used in these locations. Smart, localized, soft strategies like this help a lot, but they aren't enough. Sometimes a harder, engineered solution is needed. Bulkheads, retaining walls and levees are planned in these locations. These don't need much explaining, they are elevated, hard barriers to storm surges. In other areas where it would be cheaper and less damaging to block the surge at the entrance to an inlet, smaller storm surge barriers have been proposed like the Rockaway Inlet, Newtown Creek and Gowanus Canal, all of which allowed the storm surge in 2012 to penetrate deep into New York City neighborhoods. By far the most interesting solution is the Big U, a 16-kilometer loop around Manhattan, the jewel in NYC's crown. The Big U will use a variety of solutions too. Living shorelines with natural park levees that will double as parks for the residents will be used in places like Battery Park on the tip of Lower Manhattan. Deployable walls like these on a river in Austria will be attached to the underside of the elevated highway along the two bridges and Chinatown areas, which will flip down when needed. A bridging berm will run for 3.5 kilometers from East 13th Street to Corlears Hook Park. This design has already been awarded $335 million from the federal government for implementation and will consist of natural park bridges to connect the East River Park to the neighboring areas, with ambitious plans to cover FDR Highway completely with more park amenities. This will effectively raise the river bank by 9 feet, 4 feet above Hurricane Sandy's high water mark. This pattern of community-driven solutions will continue and wrap right around Manhattan, 
protecting it from storm surges and raising the critical sea level bar a little further out of reach. While some of these projects have begun construction and even been completed, there are many more which have been blocked by local residents. It would be easy to dismiss these people as NIMBYs or climate change deniers and that is true for many but hopefully this video will do what it was intended to do, to show the positive impacts projects like these can have on communities. New York is a city that has the financial capital to back projects like this up, but these are issues which affect all cities around the world. My own hometown of Galway has been pummeled with increasing numbers of storms every year. That has seen many buildings flooded and cars damaged. This problem is only going to get worse over time and we need to prepare and work towards minimizing climate change by investing in renewables, nuclear and other low carbon energy sources. I just started a series about Europe's transition to 100% renewable, starting with a critical first step, grid interconnectors, which will allow European countries to trade excess renewable energy. You can watch this or learn more about how solar energy works by completing this course in Solar Energy on Brilliant. In this course, you will learn the principal methods of harvesting energy from sunlight, whether that be from concentrated solar power or photovoltaic cells. And it gradually introduces you to more complicated engineering principles as you master each section. Brilliant's mission is to help people achieve their learning goals. So whether you're a student, a professional brushing up, or learning cutting edge topics, or someone who just wants to understand the world better, you should check out Brilliant. Set a goal to improve yourself and then work at that goal a little bit every day. Brilliant makes that easy with interactive explorations and a mobile app that you can use on the go. If you are naturally curious, want to build your problem solving skills, or need to develop confidence in your analytical abilities, then get Brilliant Premium to learn something new every day. Brilliant's thought-provoking math, science and computer science content helps guide you to mastery by taking complex concepts and breaking them up into bite-sized understandable chunks. You'll start by having fun with their interactive explorations. Over time, you'll be amazed at what you accomplish. As always, thanks for watching and thank you to all my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to see more from me, the links to my Instagram, Twitter, subreddit and Discord server are below.